Okay, so it's it's showing me the little red recording button in the top corner. So we're good. good? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. You we're good. are. Oh, now we just need to do the phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can see when I got so excited in the first thirty seconds. You were like, "Bring it down, Casey. Bring it yeah, down. Yeah. Turn it down just to the second. Yeah. <laughs> Calm down to a panic. So yeah. far, so good. <laughs> okay, what am I doing on here? Okay, so what is? Good afternoon there, Casey Schmidt, coming in live from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, how's it going today? I am living the good life. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. great. Super well, thanks. Uh, super well. It's, uh, it's great to have you as a guest on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Um, you basically reached out to us, uh, I think it was on Instagram, actually. And um, you, you told us like all about you. And then I, I went and I checked out your profile and watched some of your, your videos. And I was like kind of so enamored by you and your energy. And, um, you know, it's like impossible to go, no, no, let's think about it. Rather, we were just like, no, you we have to have you. You're a great, uh, you have a great message and great energy about you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm so grateful that you took a chance on me because I know that I had limited background information for you to go off of, but I promise you that this is going to be a really good chat and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow these listeners away. I'm hoping to share a lot of good stuff. <laughs> cool. Excited. cool. Well, we have no doubt about that. So we, we're super excited. So listen, Casey, you, I know that you love beautiful stories just as much as we do. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, part of what you do now is, uh, being a psychology of eating and a nutrition coach. And it actually sounds like your kind of your dad and your granddad kind of like stemmed and or led into that for you a little bit, because they taught you a lot about, um, uh, your, or they, they helped with your love for food because they loved restaurants themselves. And they taught you a lot yeah. about appreciating good food in good places, didn't they? Absolutely. I definitely have come from a foodie family and my dad, who's no longer with us, definitely instilled in me. One of my favorite things about my dad is that he was a very generous man and he would give you anything except his food. And whenever mm -hmm. we would go out to a restaurant, you know, my mom would frequently be the one that's like, do you like mine better? Oh, you can have it. We can switch. My dad would always say, Cheryl, everybody should order what they want and get whatever you want, but just don't get mine. So, <laughs> yes, so. I come from that mentality too. When people want to share, I'm like, you know what? Just order yours. Let's just yeah. all get our own. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, totally. Like anyone that thinks, you know, like, you know, half of what you order is for them. You're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I ordered I this because I wanted all of it. <laughs> so, so, so what sort of things did they, they kind of like teach you, I guess, or... You know, my dad, he definitely, he was my person. And so my, I have two older sisters and I'm the youngest of three girls. And my older sisters are very close in age. They're 17 months apart. And so I'm five and seven years younger than they are. Mm -hmm. And so um, growing up, I always say my mom and my sisters were doing a lot of things together and kind of in that space of, you know, homecoming and dresses and dances. And at the time that I remember so pivotally in my life, um, my dad was just, he was my, he was my rock. And so he had such a great sense of humor and such just a really quirky nature. Um, and so it made it especially painful when he, he got sick at the end of my eighth grade year. And so he was 45 years old and completely healthy, he used to go to Bally's total gym every day after work. Mm. Um, and they first thought it was pneumonia and then they thought it was TB and it ended up being fourth stage lung cancer and he hadn't smoked since before I was born. So it came out of the blue for sure. And so it definitely shook all of our worlds, but it was just crazy how quickly, you know, for a while there, it was like living in like, but last week he was healthy. Last month he was healthy. Mm. And because he was so young and he was only 45 years old and he was this young man, they treated him super aggressively, but the cancer still was just, it had spread to too many places. And 13 weeks later, he passed away the first day of my freshman year of high school. So, oh um, but my beautiful takeaway because I live a much richer, fuller, better life for sure from going through that incredibly hard experience. And he used to say, of course, um, over the course of that summer, he used to tell my sisters and I all the time, it doesn't matter if you live to be 45 or 85, 
the difference is the blink of an eye, Casey. What really matters is how you live your life. So live it, live it really well. And it has always, always stuck with me. So I, I truly feel like the best way for me to honor my dad has always been to live each day to the fullest and never take anything for granted. And that was just one of the many painful little hiccups in my life. But I truly wouldn't rewrite my story from it. I wouldn't because I, I carry him with me all the time. And, and I always tell people that my barometer for if I've had how my day has gone is if I haven't had a phone call where someone I love has either been in a car accident or is terminally ill, it's a pretty damn good day. So that is truly how I live my life. It really is. You and know I what? It's, yeah, geez, that's, that's really tough, Casey. You know, but, you know, Gareth and I often talk about this is, is sometimes to have a reference point of like, a little bit sort of, you know, tough times or, or we're knowing that we're not going to be here forever seems quite, you know, uh, negative to some people, but actually um, you can turn it into a positive as you've done, you know, just uh, mm-hmm. realize that we aren't here forever. So we need to be present and, and really make the most of, of each day. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's great that you took that from him as well as all the sort of lighthearted stuff, you know, like with food and that it's, uh, it's so... Oh, yeah. It's so amazing to look back and, and remember all the small things. Um, there's obviously hundreds of lessons we take from the people around us. Uh, and we don't always, you know, um, think of those until they're not around. So it's great mm-hmm. that you reflected like that. But actually, your, you know, your surname, Schmidt, is mm-hmm. um, there must be some uh, German flowing through those veins. For sure there are. Yes, my husband is very German. And actually my dad was, um, my maiden name was Garrigan, but I was Irish and German. Um, so I come from it on both sides. So we will make our way out there. <laughs> nice. And, and how is it with your, you know, with your, you had an older, two older sisters. Um, did you feel like you played that typical younger or youngest? Because I was also the youngest, you know, like sometimes the youngest is the sort of the one that's gets everyone together, peacemaker, that kind of thing? For sure. That is, I say it was a full-time job and I did it really well. I was super successful at being the, the peacemaker of our family. And I would say our roles really haven't changed too much in, in our family. I mean, now we're, we're older and we're not fighting about clothes and boys, <laughs> but, um, but I'm still very much the peacemaker of my family, which has played into what I do as a professional and how I interact with everybody in my life. So I wouldn't do it any differently, but definitely I was the, the peacemaker. Mm-hmm. I find it super interesting. Like the more I think about it and the more I hear like, you know, other people's stories and, and where they kind of fit in, in their family, it's just like really fascinating how timing is everything, you know, it, it can really make a big difference in, in your kind of whole outlook on life, you know? So for example, you two guys are both uh, the youngest in your family, uh, I, I'm the oldest, I only have my sister. And, you know, her, dis, her perception of the world is, is slightly different to me because one of the reasons is she's the youngest, you know, and, and it's the same for you. It's just really fascinating how timing, you know, mm-hmm. makes such a big difference in our lives. Mm. Oh, it's so true. And when I look at my sisters who are my best friends, but we are all so different and now having two daughters myself, it goes to show you, you know, the whole nature versus nurture. And like, it's amazing to me that we really were basically raised the exact same, same parents, same nurturing environment, but there is certainly something to birth order and for sure, because we are very different. Yeah. Mm. yeah that it blows is- me away too nature versus nurture you know like mm-hmm. just twins like you do friends of mine or like you know my, my wife and that is a twin and you know just it's amazing they've had the exact same even with, in terms of timing things seem the same but yeah. you know you just something in there just gives you this totally different personalities and that's it's those subtle day-to-day timings isn't it that ultimately down the track change who you are or grow you into who you are it's, it's really cool to see yeah, for sure. It is. It's so neat. Yeah. And, and so uh, you, you mentioned that you were like a, a bit of a, a people pleaser um, growing up and, and mm-hmm. in your life. And uh, you were also quite shy by the sounds of it and a little bit sort of self-conscious. And one of the things that you used to do is you always used to wear uh, things called capris, I think that's what they're <laughs> called. <laughs> yeah. Because you were self-conscious about, say, like how, how your legs look. You, you felt that they looked disgusting. Was this yes. something you, you struggled with as a youngster? 
For sure it was. And, you know, now in this line of work, I just have such a heart for my, my younger self because, you know, in some ways we haven't always evolved into better humans in some areas, you know, but in this area, I'm so proud that my daughters have the role models that we have now and the people that are so body positive. I mean, there just cannot be enough of that. Um, growing up, being the youngest, my two older sisters who are just beautiful girls and they always were, um, but they were, they were, and they still are stick thin and they are just, they come by it. That's their body type. And, and I jokingly like to say that I came out of the womb with curves because I just, <laughs> I never had that body type. I didn't. And, you know, all growing up as a kid, people would they kind of just size you up, right? They look at you and they're, oh, you don't look like your sisters or you have such a cute face, but you don't match the rest of the family. And, and you always knew, you know, I knew what that meant. And so whether they had any ill intention or not, it always, it just made you kind of like lose the little gust out of your wind when someone would remind you that you don't have the same thin frame that your sisters have. And so I think, you know, looking back, Again, I, I wouldn't rewrite any part of my story, but that's where I developed amazing strength in other areas because I feel like, you know, when you, in my mind, if I wasn't going to have, if I wasn't going to be this cute, thin girl that got attention for that, then I was going to be funny or lighthearted or adventurous and carefree. And it definitely played into my people pleasing for sure. Um, and it all, it all came to a head for me when I was in, it was the summer going into eighth grade. So it was the summer before my dad got sick and it started, I was always a very active girl, um, but I was definitely a little chunkier and I like to call it pleasantly plump. And <laughs> I, I was really a happy girl, but I had always thought if I could just be thin like my sister's wow, that would just be, that'd be it, right? Then I would, I'd have everything. And so I started off on a very normal diet, just being conscious of what I was eating. And I'm a, I was a big swimmer. So we had two practices a day. And so very active. And over the course of that summer, at some point, I stopped kind of controlling the diet and the diet started controlling me. And I'm not exactly sure at what point that was, but it, it felt really scary because I had turned into someone that I had never known before. And I didn't recognize myself in the fact that I was super withdrawn. I didn't want to go out. Um, I was lying all the time to my mom and to my family and to my dad about where I had been and who I'd been with trying to cover up eating. And it caused me so much anxiety. And I, I remember having this very, gosh, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I was in my sister's closet and they had all these beautiful dresses, homecoming dresses and prom dresses and turnabout dresses. And they had never fit me before, but now I had lost so much weight and I was putting these dresses on and they were just falling off of me. They just were way too big. And I was mm. just, I was just sobbing and I was just thinking, when is this going to be fun? When is this going to be, when is this going to be worth it? And I had put so much, I had put so much power and I had idealized this whole idea of being thin like them and what it would mean. And the whole world would open up to me and it was quite the opposite. And I had never felt so lonely and depressed and isolated. And so thankfully my mom, um, I think it's really easy to hide eating disorders from those closest to you because they see you all the time. And so the weight comes off more gradually to them. And, mm -hmm. and I really, I had been a great liar. And so Thankfully, we were watching, I don't know if where you guys are at, she's as popular, we were watching an Oprah show. Um, mm -hmm. Back in the day, Oprah, as she still is Oprah, right? But we were watching an Oprah show on eating disorders and it just, it described me to a T and mm -hmm. we both kind of had this like aha moment that I was needing some help quick. Mm -hmm. And so um, my mom had made me an appointment 
with the place that she recommended because we're both Chicago based. And we went there the following week and had a really long full day of testing and analysis and everything. And so at the very end of that appointment, um, two doctors had come in kind of abruptly and said that I couldn't go home and that I needed to be admitted because my, oh, nice. my heart rate was so dangerously low. Sure. It was 39 beats a minute. And so whoa, it was whoa. like, yeah, you could, you, you know, you're just at risk for so much and your heart is not strong enough. And so I, I mean, just as a, as a 12 or 13 year old at that time in my life, it was just felt like so scary to be left alone at this place for 10 days and mm -hmm. have no access to my family. And, you know, but, but it was through the course of that. And then that year and during my eighth grade year of going down and seeing a specialist that a lot of healing happened. And again, so grateful because now the work that I do with helping people come from a place of self-love and loving their body, I, I really am grateful, even though that was such a painful time in my life, because firsthand I got to see how being so thin, which I had always thought would be the answer to everything, it just, it didn't make me happy. It didn't bring me joy. And so that has been something that's really change the trajectory of how I look at my body and try how I help other people with their body. Because for me now, it's just all about health. And when you come from a place of self-love and you love your body and you recognize it's the only one we get, you want to feed it well, you want to serve it well, you want to move it well. And it doesn't, it no longer ever comes from a place of, oh, but I want to fit into this dress size or I want to rock a, you know, a bikini and I, you know, need to have this to look good. And it just comes from the bigger picture of, of being healthy. So. I love that. Yeah, that's so important. The, the health, if that can become your focus, everything changes, you know, it and, does. but you know, it's unbelievable Casey, how, um, how prevalent uh, eating disorders are actually, you know, it's like mm -hmm. becoming more talked about, but it's, it's unbelievable. Like uh, how many uh, young people have had to go through this, but I'm interested to know, you, you said your mom and you both realized that you had a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, like how, like what did your mom see in you that was just purely the weight or did she, had she seen other signs as well? No, you know, I, I think it was just when we were watching a show that highlighted eating disorders and it had all of these different girls um, mm -hmm. and some boys of different different ages and different ranges and, and different sizes. Cause I think the misconception is to have an eating disorder, you have to be stick thin and mm. that's, that's not the case at all. And so it, it comes from the mentality, the, the framework that you, that you bring to the table is who you are as an eater. Right. And so when we were watching this and we were listening to these girls, it's like, it just clicked like, Oh my goodness this is Casey. And it, for me, it was like, this is me talking. This is how I feel about my body. This is how I've withdrawn from friends and social situations. This is the amount of pressure I feel on myself and that I let the scale dictate everything about my day. Um, all the obsessive qualities that had kind of overtaken my life at that time even the way I would eat the same thing every day, I would eat, I would take a small potato and I would cut it into the tiniest little pieces and I would eat it with this little baby fork so slowly. And I'm all about mindful eating, but I mean, it clearly had, it, was, it <laughs> clearly level. came, yeah, it, it was clearly it coming from a very obsessive place. Mm. And so that has helped me because at different stages in my life, and I think for a lot of us, we can get kind of obsessive about different, different things, whether it be career or health or eating or running. And so it's just remembering to keep a hold on it because when it starts to control us, then we know that we've got to, we've got to look more clearly at what's going on, right? And, and mm -hmm. clearly it had started to control me instead of me being in charge of myself and how I felt. Mm. You know what I find fascinating as well is like, you're so young, right? And and so many people are that have like eating disorders. Like we're so young and you, you, you know, in your developed whatsoever, but you can be so controlled with certain things. And like, 
um, so obsessive and it's just, it's just quite interesting. Like how, you know, you're 12 years old and you can be so obsessive about one thing and you're like, you literally have not even started your life. I um, know. Yeah. I know it is amazing. And, and you know, my, my growing up, because in a lot of situations like that, it can stem from what we eat is at least one thing we can control, right? And, mm-hmm. and a lot of times for women and men, young boys, young girls, it can come from the rest of their world feeling very out of control. So if you have very overbearing parents or teachers or coaches, you know, what you choose to eat and how much you put in your body feels like, okay, at least I've got this area that I can control. But, you know, interestingly enough, in my family and in my experience, I I can't pinpoint it to anything like that other than me just idolizing my thin older sisters, because I'm really grateful to say that my parents, they never put pressure or made me feel shameful about my weight or my body. And I'm so grateful, but that doesn't a lot of times you see a, a bigger family component to that pressure. And in my family, that wasn't the situation. But yeah, it is interesting. Would your sisters make sort of offhand comments like, oh, look at those cheeks or, you know, like, yeah. well, I don't know, you know, like. <laughs> I, don't think they said it, I don't think they said it quite as cute as that, but <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely, um, they definitely did. And, you know, now they've both apologized for any, I mean, they were young too. Yeah, you don't know yeah. it's necessarily, right. but those things go inside, don't they? They, oh, they, they were incredibly painful, and and I think that right, that's how families work. You you figure out what your brother or sister's like trigger is, exactly. and then then we use it, right? We mm. we exploit that, and it hurts so badly, and so mm. but yeah. But I, I freed them of any guilt because I. I do forgive them, but yeah, there was some, there was some nasty comments for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you, you, you also sort of struggled with something else. Your, so your, your first dream, uh, dream job was to be a dermatologist uh, yes. and, or, and or a makeup artist. Um, yes. Is that because you had bad skin as a kid? Yes. Yeah. Um, it and is. How did funny. that affect you? Um, you know, just another one of those little trophies of being a teenager, right? Um, mm-hmm. I definitely had really problematic skin. And so I have so many, it's amazing. I have so many good experiences or good memories because I have so many memories of going to the dermatologist. And I don't know if where you guys are, if back when I was a kid, the dermatologist when you were a teen was like the thing to do. And, yeah. and so, but you had to go with no makeup on. So mm-hmm. here I was like a preteen and then a teenager. And my mom would always make such a big deal, like wash your face. He's got to see your skin perfectly, you know, naked skin. And so, and then I just remember time and time and time again, being in the dermatologist's office and having like the boy I had the biggest crush on like walk wow. in and I'd be like, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. Like, and it's like everybody you knew would be at the dermatologist at the same time. And, you know, um, so I, my biggest, my first big goal was to be a dermatologist that then I always love to apply and play with makeup, which is funny because of how it works into um, what I do now. But I always said I wanted to be a dermatologist that would help people, you know, get on the right regimen for their skin. And then I would have like makeup there to then give them a makeover and make them like leave my place feeling mm-hmm. really pretty and really good about their skin and their, their self-confidence. And so, um, yeah, I, I missed the mark on the dermatology. That probably would have been a really <laughs> lucrative business to go into. But, um, but the, the skincare and the makeup line, I do, I do, I do do that now. So that's been one big component that stuck with me. And I, and I love to make women feel better about their skin and, and mm. especially safe, clean makeup and skincare, because at the end of the day, our skin is the largest organ we have. And so I am all about health. And um, it, I really truly believe what we put on our skin every single day has a huge impact on our overall health. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Totally. Yeah. It's, and it's amazing. Like, your skin and especially your face is that one thing which you literally, you, you never sort of cover up. It's always exposed. And, and like, mm-hmm. especially as a kid at school, like Craig and I can 
totally relate to how you felt like we both had bad skin as, as kids I, I was on Rakuten and um, you know Craig I don't know if you want any medicine well. yourself as well Rakuten too yeah so um, mm -hmm. it was traumatic actually you know because <laughs> you're going through the stage where you, you're figuring yourself out you're figuring out where you sit in this kind of hierarchy of, of kids and uh you, I don't know, you feel like really kind of ashamed because you've got these blemishes on your face and it can really knock your self-confidence, eh? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I... But this, sorry, sorry. I thought you were you done. Know? Sorry. I, I am. I'm, it's just, it brings you back. It's, it's painful for sure. It makes you have a heart for all of the kids going through it right now. Mm, <laughs> for sure. But there's another layer, you know, Gareth, what I was just, what when you were saying there is that the dermatologists and all that, it also sets a lot of youngsters up for... Um, for being on medicines from a young age, which I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure that's a good thing at that age. You know what I mean? Like oh, maybe there's another way, like, you know, with, you know, and you talk about this Casey is like the, the different kinds of sort of natural products or maybe look at the diet more or these kind of things. And also like there's a degree that that's normal, you know, your skin's changing, you're getting hormones. Obviously there's an extreme on any end of any spectrum, but um, I also feel like that, that 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 could be handled better sometimes, you know, as you said as well, that's kind of why you wanted to be in that industry. It's not mm -hmm. just rock up at the dermatologist and then just be ready with your script because oh, yeah. that, that's just what every kid comes in here for. And I, I just feel like that could be definitely handled better, you know? Oh, for sure. And I mean, definitely, I think it's one of those things that when you know better, you do better. And mm. I think that what we know, I mean, I'm 38 now. And so going back to even just, you know, 25 years ago, we've learned so much. And so I agree. I mean, there's still people that are looking for that script, but I'm certainly not right. We've learned that like, if you can, if you can correct something, whether it being your skin or, you know, antibiotics, I mean, Thank goodness for Western medicine, yes, but I'm a huge proponent of like heal the body through thy food and through how you mm. treat it. And, you know, um, one of my, so I had my experience of my dad obviously was very impactful and of a health standpoint and of a, a realization of the fragility of life in our health. And then unfortunately, that was freshman year of high school, my first year. And two years later, his only brother, uh, my Uncle Pat, who was just an incredible man himself, um, very much reminded me of my dad. And I was just really always glad to have him in my life. He got sick also at 45 years old. He was two years younger than my dad. And he got sick with a completely unrelated, different kind of cancer, a glioblastoma. And wow. sadly, he passed away as well. And um, those, those two experiences has totally shaped who I am as far as the health um, component to me. And when I was younger, of course, I had, I had huge amounts of health anxiety because, you know, you have two people close to you that you love in your life mm -hmm. die at such young ages. And it totally like embedded this fear of everybody gets sick with cancer. Everybody's going to die of cancer. You have to catch it before it catches you. And I just kind of had this weight when it came to health anxiety that I always just had on my shoulders and in my heart. And I think the body is so amazing because I didn't recognize what I was doing then, but now I can see exactly what I was doing. And I started college down at DePaul University in Chicago, and I was living in the city and I just could not get my hands on enough books and research and medical journals about how the body is amazing at healing itself if we're good to it. And it brought so much peace to my life to realize, oh, we're not just all victims like waiting yeah. to get our sentence. We have an active role here. And how we eat and how we sleep and how we treat others and how we meditate and how our stress level is, all of that and what we put on our skin, all of that plays into the larger picture for us. And that was so incredibly freeing for me and it still is that I no longer live in fear because I feel like, yes, there's a lot out of our control 
and we can't worry about everything, but what's in our control, like I absolutely choose wisely. And so I think there's so much power to that when that switches, because as someone who had two people that I love dearly, like watch them suffer like that, it was so amazing to no longer have to kind of carry that fear and to feel like I'm playing a very vital role in taking care of my health. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's definitely how, you know, I always say I'm, I'm so not a salesperson at all, but I do sell beauty counter products. And as hard as that is for me to even say sometimes, because I just don't want the stigma of being a direct marketing salesperson that I don't know why to each their own. And I say, anyone that's doing it, I have the most utmost respect for you. But for me, it came from when I had my oldest daughter, Charlotte, I went to a geneticist because I had really done great with my health anxiety. And I just was reading everything I could get my hands on. But when I had a daughter, I thought, okay, I wanna know what is our, what should, what's on my radar? What's my family history that I should be careful of? Because we definitely have a, a fair amount of cancer in our, in our family. And so when I went to her, it was so eye-opening because what she said was, the easiest way to be healthy is what you put on your skin every single day. And I remember looking at her and being like, gosh, that sounds too simple, right? Mm-hmm. And, but it's funny because interestingly enough, up until like, and she's 13, all the books I had read, all the medical journals I had read, not too much had come out about the skin and the connection to it being the largest organ we have and the amount that we absorb through our bloodstream in the first 60 seconds. And so when she said that, because she was like, here's this new hormonal mom that's trying to eat organic and natural and raw and doing everything she can. And she was like, Casey, just calm down. You're doing everything right, but just, just, take the steps that are in your control. And so when she told me about that, for as far as my new daughter, that's where I was like, oh my gosh, I need to find safer products for our skin. And I can honestly say I had never given it any thought. I was super organic and natural and I cared about all these other things. And I was still using like chemical laden products on every part of my body and my baby's body. And mm-hmm. so that was hugely eye opening. And so I was a teacher by trade. And I, as soon as in my mind I switched to, I always say I don't sell it, I share it because I think there's a lot of really healthy, focused people that still have no idea how important the skin is and what we put it on our body. And, and I just think there's still, there's still room for us to grow and learn from that because I think that's a newer concept. And, and you guys definitely do a better job, but here in the United States, our lack of regulation as far as what chemicals can go into our skincare products is really, really sad. So. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Look, it's uh there's so much in there actually just just to just to start off with life is so sort of delicate like mm-hmm. um it, it's it, it's it's really kind of sad how quickly things can can change you know and just talking about your dad and your uncle and stuff and you know it, it's always these reminders that we have that you've just got to make the most of it and that's exactly what you said you're doing and um We've had two recent reminders recently, like a, a lady who was on our podcast, the most incredible yeah. woman ever. She was in a, a motor car accident and, and she passed away. And um, this was last weekend or two weekends ago. And then another really famous guy in South Africa, literally um, as fit as a fiddle, you know what I mean? 49 years old, ex-professional f- sports player, uh, came home from gym last Friday, had a heart attack, d- dead. Um, yeah. so life is so precious and so delicate. We really need to make the most of it and whatever we can do to make it better and to improve our health is important. You know, you, you, you said there's not much we can actually, well, no, there, there, there's, there's a lot what we can't control, but there's, yeah. there's a ton that we can control too, you know, and I think that actually outweighs the stuff that we can't. And, um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about say, like clean skin products, what are they actually? And I mean, are they really clean? Like I I always kind of struggle with this sometimes, you know, because, um, well, first of all, there's some companies that, that, that say they are, but they aren't, but, um, maybe we can just talk about that for a little bit just to kind of understand that better. 
Yeah, I think it's so interesting because what you just said is so true. And this was, this was my frustration after I had had this experience with going to a geneticist and, and learning about that connection, right? About what we put on our body and the impact it has. And so I was like, okay, I can figure this out. And I got to work. And what I found out from researching so many companies is they do exactly that. There's a lot of greenwashing and there's a lot of Sadly, the regulation is just not there to hold these com- these companies accountable. And so pretty much here in the United States, you can say anything's natural, clean, safe, even organic when it comes to skincare means very, very little as far as the amount of chemicals they can hide in there and, it, and they don't have to disclose it. Here, it's, it's the word fragrance is a very toxic, coined, dirty term because for some reason, it's like the, it's like the tight lip secret here is that under the word fragrance, you can just put in a ton of chemicals that are really dangerous, linked to harming human health that we don't have to disclose. Hmm. And so I, how I found Beauty Counter, who I currently am a consultant for, is because, I don't know if you guys have heard of the EWG. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. So, it's amazing, right? It's the Environmental Working Group, and it's a nonprofit organization that ranks products on their toxicity levels. So it gives it a number, right? Like one or two being like so clean and safe, and nine or 10 being highly toxic. And it gives you exactly what it's linked to and why you'd want to stay away from it. And so that was like my Bible. And so Honestly, I'm here, I'm this new mom, and everywhere I go, I'm taking out my little app, and I'm grateful for it, right? And it ranks products, everything, not just skincare, but cleaning products and all kinds of things. I think there's like 88,000, you know, brands in there. So a lot of stuff. Um, And so I would be in the middle of like Target aisle or the grocery store aisle. And I'm sitting there with my baby and I'm trying to like look up what number does this soap have or does this mascara have? And my frustration came is because you could have a company, and I won't use any names, but you could have a company where they market themselves as really clean, really high end, totally safe, some even organic. And one color is a two or a three, which is a a really good number. And then as soon as you buy it one shade darker or one shade lighter, it jumps up to a nine or 10. And my frustration was so maddening because I was like, well, that's well, there's no consistency. So it's not that the company took out the harmful chemicals linked to harming human health. They just kind of like find the little loopholes to have it in some products, but not all products. So unless you were kind of like a crazy person like me, you wouldn't see that, oh, no, no, they've got them in this product and this product and this product. And so... Beauty Counter is a, it's a company that's amazingly successful here in the United States. Um, it was in 2018, it was um, our number one trending beauty company. And the reason why I love it and I so believe in it is because they have 100% committed themselves to truth and transparency. And they are committed to not using any ingredients linked to harming human health. And they third-party test everything down to the containers the products are in can Mm. even leach dangerous plastics and things like that. Mm. And so for me, I had no interest in becoming a consultant, but when I found, when I found it myself and it had really gotten my skin in the best shape of my life and they have baby products and and products for men and sunscreen And what I found was it was an answer to having to worry about always looking up because they're consistent. They just will not have these dangerous ingredients in their products. And so I was like, thankfully, I'm done with being on the search for things. And so what happens is when you find something you love and believe in, you are naturally telling your mom and your sisters and your cousins and your neighbors, because I love all of these people. So I was like, oh my gosh, you've got to stop using that and start using this. And it was probably like the 15th person that was like, why don't you sell this? And I was like, oh, because that's so weird and I don't want to do that. But then I switched because I was like, people need to know this information. So I try to do it 
really sprinkling, um, but I think it's really important. And I think the message is what it is. And people, when you know better, you do better. And so, and there's nothing shady about Beauty Counter. They're a B corporation, which means they put, um, they're recognized. That's like the top honor you can possibly get for putting people and planet above profit. And they're just an amazing company. They're, they're, they're up there with like the Tom and the Patagonias and just mm. really incredible companies for trying to do really good stuff. So. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, why would someone see a genetic geneticist um, after having your, your daughter um, okay. and, and before maybe? Yeah. So in my, with my family history, so I don't think most people probably are seeing a genesis. I think the only, I think women might hear that term when they're pregnant about genetic testing. And um, my reasoning for seeing one after I had my daughter was because when we had learned a little bit more about my dad's cancer and my uncle's cancer and cancers that run in my family that my grandpa had and on both sides of my family, it just made me you know, they weren't thoughts that had been planted in me until I had a daughter. And then I thought, okay, you know, then you instantly want to live forever. And you have this like realization that I need to take such great care of my body because now I'm in charge of another human. And so for me, I wanted to be able to know what my predisposition was if I had any concerns for more regular testing. Thankfully, everything was really good and I, I didn't have too much that I needed to worry about. But um, they just do, a geneticist does like an all around kind of check for if you should be having more regular testing on certain parts of your body because of your predisposition in your genes. Hmm. It's so important. Yeah. It's, once yeah. again, as you said, you, we're not victims, which is yeah. amazing. Like it's good to know what you predispose to, but we have the power to make change. And I think that's the real big message there is that we are not the slave to those genes either way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, now, now you spoke about and the, the, the horrible story with your dad uh, and your uncle um, and, and you, these sort of events in your life have shaped you were there other events in your life that sort of created this this shift in your in your thinking um and 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 maybe tell us about those but also maybe how things have been shaped for you due to these tough events okay um yes unfortunately i had two other pretty you know i had losing my dad and my uncle obviously ranks at the top. Um, mm -hmm. But I did have, and the eating disorder definitely shaped what I'm doing now. And But um, when I was in junior high, and this will kind of come full circle when I tell you what I'm doing with junior high kids right mm -hmm. now, but I had two tragedies happen in my life in those course of those two years, pretty much back to back. And one was uh, a friend of mine in our community and who was on the soccer field, a super beautiful, young, smart girl, um, who was just on the soccer field after school having practice. And a 39-year-old woman had a seizure at the wheel. And she went across a large, vast field through trees. And it was ridiculous. And, and the whole team went running. And she was run over. And she died. And that was... That was actually the first um, tragedy of my younger life. And her brother was in my class. And I remember, I just remember this is when, you know, I was leaving on a regular basis and saying, you know, I hate you to my sisters or they hated me or mm -hmm. saying mean comments. And I remember being so fixated, one, on like the fact that she just wasn't here anymore. Mm -hmm. I had never had anybody in my life die that was a young person and two I just could not fathom like that that could happen to my sisters and I not have an opportunity to tell them I love them or I'm sorry and it's it's ironic because what that did to me and it started right then and it was actually very annoying that it started but it did and that was I became obsessive about saying I love you is the last thing I say whenever anybody I loved walked out the door and what that looked like just to give you a visual is my sister saying really horrible mean nasty things at me when I was when she was leaving or I was leaving and I would be so angry and so mad but I would be like but I love you, but 
but I just love you. And, <laughs> and I remember that they didn't always respond favorably. And mm. it was more like my security blanket because that had such an impact on my life. And now this many years later, it still has stuck with me where anyone in my family, that has to be the last thing I say. It just has to be. And the joke of, in my town is you'd be hard pressed to find a, a delivery person, a pizza delivery person, or anybody that I haven't told them I love them because <laughs> I slip and say it so frequently <laughs> that like it's so awkward when you're getting something, you're putting in an order for Chinese food. This just happened over the weekend. And I'm like, okay, thanks. All right, I'll be there in about 25 minutes. Okay, love you. And then <laughs> you, walk, you walk into the restaurant and they're like, oh, we haven't gotten that before. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'd rather slip and tell too many than, love. Tell, than, exactly. spell, than, yeah, than say it too few. But um, that had a huge impact on me. And then um, in eighth grade, a boy, pretty much one of my first crushes, um, who just on the outside, he was super adorable, athletic, great big hockey player, great family, and he, he shot himself. Mm -hmm. And so that was also just couldn't wrap my brain around that. So, you know, my younger teenage years, like where you're really just kind of finding yourself and having those formative years were very much shaped by a lot of tragedy. I mean, I feel like every time we were just recovering we were hit with something else and then, you know, throw in my eating disorder and my dad getting sick. And, and then a couple of years later, my cousin, who was very, very close in my life, his fiance, who was a, a very family to us for sure. Um, she was killed in a car accident on her first way. She was a teacher on her first day of school teaching at 22 years old. So God. all of that, I mean, I always say, I'm not trying to win any awards for the most traumatic upbringing, but at the end of the day, I would truly not rewrite any of it because I live all of that. I live for all of those people on a very regular basis. And it's what keeps me in check because I think it's our culture that we always want to go farther and faster and we want to push it. Mm. And, you know, I would say if there's, if there's one hang up from me living so presently, which I wouldn't change it, but if there's one drawback. It's that sometimes I cannot move as quickly in my business or in areas because I do live so in the moment that a lot of times at night when my kids get home, like I'm all for them. Like it's like, and you know, there's, there's a, there's, there's a reason to have ambition and I am ambitious, but I keep it all in check. And I do know that at the end of the day, you know, my legacy is not going to be what I did. It's going to be who I was. And mm -hmm. really to my family, that's, that's all that matters to me. So I do mm -hmm. have really big goals and dreams and I want books and podcasts and talk shows in my future. And I'll get there at my little turtle pace, but it's not going to stress me out in the here and now where I don't realize the value of where I'm at right now with my family. So. Mm -hmm. It's so much more important though, isn't it? You know, like mm -hmm. the, the yardsticks that we've sort of created, they're almost kind of fictitious in a way, you know, like about what success looks like and all these sort of things. But we, we, we've got it completely wrong, I think, on so many levels. And then what you describe, like, you know, about what's important for you in your life, you know, your family and, and, and everything around that, you know, that's, that's actually really what it is. You know, as long as, as, long as we're fulfilled, I think, mm -hmm. and we loved, then what else do you really, really want? You know? Um, so I really like that. And also, I also feel, and Craig and I talk about this a lot too, because we're of similar minds, especially with the way you talk about sales and these sort of things. Like it really is a long game to be honest with you. You know, we, we're going to live so long. Like literally, I think we, we all think life is super short, but actually, especially now we, we're living longer and longer. And um, by being that authentic person, that's going to play out better for you in the long run. Do you know what I mean? So maybe you're mm -hmm. not like reaping the, these amazing benefits now, like say financially or from a status or whatever sort of point of view, like it doesn't matter because it's all about the long game. And mm -hmm. you know, if you're that authentic, nice, loving person now, 
that the, the, the payback, it might not be financial or whatever, it's going to be something else uh, in the long run is just going to be so worth it and in abundance. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely, you know, we definitely relate to that sort of way of being. I think it's, uh, I think it's a really important lesson for, for a lot of people, especially in this day and age where instant gratification is something that people are after. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, so talking about like teenagers, right? Yeah. Um, you believe that we're currently in this crisis at the moment uh, around teenagers with suicide and mm-hmm. overdoses and alcohol and depression and um, I do. all these sort of things. So why do you actually think that is happening? Um, yeah, I feel so strongly. Um, and my heart is just so in it for our teens. I think that a big culprit for sure is social media. And I think that, you know, social media is not all bad. It isn't. Of course, we know that. But I think you have to be really picky and choosy about who you follow and what messages mm-hmm. you allow to seep in, right? And, and even at my age, you know, I'd be lying to say if my feelings don't get hurt when you see different groups hanging out together, right? And you know, it's so funny because even at 38 years old, you can think, oh, how come I didn't get the invite? You know, so so it doesn't, I don't mm. fault these poor teens that at the end of a night when they're feeling so lonely and down and they, they pull up their Snapchat or their whatever and they mm. see everybody, it looks like rainbows and unicorns and it's okay. the highlight reel of everybody around them getting together and doing this and this and they think, my gosh. I've been in my bed since eight o'clock in pajama pants. My life never looks like that, you know? And I think it can be so lonely and isolating for them because I think it reinforces this message that we know are not truths, right? Like when we look at Instagram, we recognize hopefully as adults that it is usually the highlight reel, right? It's, it's mm. the best of the best. And when I'm looking at social media, I'm only following people like you guys and and like-minded people that are trying to pour in positivity, right? And so, but it is, it takes a conscious diligence to say, wow, well, that body and she wants to sell me on those pills and that looks pretty amazing. Should I maybe do that? I'm not feeling too good about myself. It takes a conscious concerted effort for an adult. And I just think kids don't know they've you know this whole the whole phone being so accessible Mm -hmm. i mean we're just all a bunch of guinea pigs really and so i feel like sadly we're seeing that it's not serving our kids well you know and and now from my experience and my tumultuous challenging experience as a teenager without even social media but just pain um, and now I have a teenager and we're so close and I've, I've been able to embark on doing some really exciting things. Um, I'm right in the middle of it right now with um, my local junior high and some, and some new, some upcoming ones in the near future about really filling these kids up and starting a movement that I've created called I See You, You Matter, because I want these kids to know that I see you, I see your failures, I see your weaknesses, I see your insecurities with your bad skin and your chunky thighs. I see you just how you are and you matter and you're important and you're valued. And I really want kids to feel seen and heard and valued. Um, I think it's super interesting, of course, I'm a research geek and I love that pop psychology would say that that human's greatest fear is the fear of being rejected. And and don't get me wrong, I think that is a huge fear for most of us, mm-hmm. right? And and truly a concern for sure for everyone and still on um, upsetting. But what my point is is I really think that I think his name is Bob McCartney and he says human's greatest fear now is of being invisible, is of not being seen is of not feeling of any worth. And I think that's the crisis that we're in right now, especially with our teens, that they feel just not worthy and not valued. And my goal of what I'm doing in the schools right now, I just presented actually last Friday to all the staff 
and to the teachers because I think it starts with empowering our teachers to recognize the huge, vast power that they have to impact and touch these kids. And that cannot be underestimated because so many times we want to think that kids are all getting this and getting filled up and poured into at home. But sadly, that's not always the truth. And, and I don't blame parents. Trust me, I'm a parent and I think parents are doing the best they can with what they have and what they know. But I think that our teachers get our students, get our kids for such a long chunk of the day and their eye contact, they're that a boy, they're that a girl, great work. Um, mm. It can have such an impact just to feel like these kids felt seen, felt noticed, felt like they accomplished something. And I just think it's amazing. And our teachers are really, in my mind, our biggest influencers that are, are touching our kids' lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we need to remind them of that power because they're working their butts off, they're tired, they have their own family baggage. But I think when you can spark that light in them, it's really exciting to see the magic. So I am doing an all-school assembly um, in, a, in about a couple of weeks. And then I will be doing monthly video challenges for the entire school to my goal is to just kind of build like a psychological toolbox of tips and tricks and suggestions to help fuel them in knowing how worthy they are and to help kind of weather the storms that are going to come their way um, and live life healthier and happier and live life to the fullest. So mm. I've definitely got my work cut out for me, but I feel very clear cut on the importance of it and my commitment to it. And I, I really see it very clearly and I'm really excited because I think we can we can definitely have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. For sure. It's amazing, Casey. Seriously, like as you mentioned with the social media, I think it's not the social media itself that's the issue. It's really just the the ease with which you can compare either yourself mm -hmm. to. And so by doing what you're doing, like you mentioned body positivity and that kind of thing, you, you have to really fill their cups up with their self-esteem and that because that's always going to be there, that mirror, that, that other thinner person, the faster, yeah. bigger, stronger, whatever it is, is going to be there. So um, that's not going away. So how do we sort of counterbalance that? And it's just, yeah, it's just incredible what's out there. I actually, I spoke to a friend of mine recently who dealt with eating disorders and she was, she showed me a, um, a an account about, um, this girl who's anorexic, but like super proud of it and, and promoting it. And, and then how many followers there are of these kinds of things. And, and it's, it's really hectic here. Like what, what, what is out there? So like you say, it has to start at home, but then with, with, with teachers and the, the people they're interacting with, it's so important to balance that. And we yeah. have to almost go over the top to balance that because there's really strong influences the other way. So yeah. maybe tell us a little bit more about the program and, and also like, what can we all do to, to help out uh, the teenagers? You know, I just think, so it's, you know, it's so huge. Every time I see a teen, um, and, and really in general, not just teens, I feel this way about all people. Honestly, I, I work with people as young as 11 and as old as 87. And when I was talking to these teachers, what I like to share with them is that my range of clients is huge, right? But the interesting part is what is on an 11 year old's radar of what upsets them and what holds them back and what their insecurities are and what their worries and fears are, ironically looks incredibly close to the 87 year old. And my point is, what are we worried about as people? We're worried about our bodies. We're worried about anxiety, social anxiety, fitting in, being accepted, mm. you know, finding our finding our calling um fulfilling you know mm -hmm. other people's needs of us and you know whether it's if you're a kid you want to please your parents and your teachers and your coaches and you want to make the team when you're a new mom you want to do a good job nobody's telling you you're doing a great job you know you you question yourself all the time and so i guess i would just say this in general you know it's funny my girls have grown up where 
whenever we go anywhere. Um, but let's just take the grocery store, the library, for example, you know, um, we'll kind of recognize, and now they, they, I've instilled in them that they'll recognize, they'll be like, yeah, she's kind of cranky, mom, this person that we're talking with or dealing with. And it's always my goal to help turn that around by asking about them, by complimenting them, by, by valuing something that they're doing. Wow, you are really helpful. Nobody else could help me find this book, or I'm so excited you took the time to be patient with me, or whatever it might be. And I am so glad my kids have seen firsthand it works almost every single time by our kindness, by valuing them, by seeing them. And it works for kids, it works for adults, it works for everyone. So I guess it would just be, you know, we can all be, and I love your podcast, we can all just be better humans. And we can take the extra second or two to smile. And sometimes it's even just a smile. You know, it's like we forget that we can, we have that power just in our face. You don't even have to hmm. say anything, you know? You can be exhausted and still turn somebody else's world around. And so for our students, I was trying to explain to the teachers that I didn't want to turn off teachers that thought, well, you know, this is junior high and there's a ton of expectations on our teachers and test scores and all these other requirements. And I said, listen, I don't want anyone to be like, oh, well, I'm not a warm fuzzy and I'm not going to stand in the room and have a little prayer and do a little dance. And I'm just not going to do that. And I said, that's not my expectation. You know, the one thing is, I think that kids more than ever need to be held accountable to standards. I'm an incredibly strict, firm, loving parent. And in my home, I don't even need to yell because my kids know. If I look at them a certain way, they're like, oh, mom's ticked, right? But <laughs> I have ridiculous expectations. And just like I want the teachers to have ridiculous expectations, I have no problem saying, you know what, this is not the kind of work quality that I know you can do. I'm so excited to see better. Can't wait to read it tomorrow, Penelope. Like, you know, like I have no problem saying, yeah, you missed the mark, but I'm super excited and I believe you can do it tomorrow. Um, you know, just putting a positive quote on the board, just telling a kid, you know, sometimes recognizing that this is just a really hard season in their life. And, mm -hmm. and that we understand that. And, you know, if teachers are willing to be a little bit more vulnerable and share a bad skin story or a story about not wanting to wear shorts because you were self-conscious of your legs, like relating to the kids so that they can feel like, oh, you're human. You're not just my math teacher. Like you do get it. And then the, the, the reward for everybody is then the kids feel seen and they feel heard and not so alone. But then kids really do want to please people. They want to do well in their parents' eyes. They want to do well in their teacher's eyes. And when I was a teacher and I would connect with my students, they would come back and they'd blow me away because I know that they wanted to impress me. They wanted to come back and tell me stories of how a kid on the playground was getting bullied, but they ran to the rescue and they were super excited to invite him to come play Foursquare. And all they were looking for was a, that's amazing. I'm so proud of you. You should feel so good about yourself. And then they were like, yeah, I do. That felt good. And so it's just little tiny baby things, but it's a practice. And I think as a whole, a lot of times we're out of the practice. We've got so many other things on our plate, so much other mind space just going a million miles, so many to-do lists that we forget about the little tiny things. Mm -hmm. And really what fills me up, what makes me feel great about myself is pouring into others. And I don't think I'm so unique. I think that's what makes people feel really good is making others, filling up others. And it doesn't have to be any grand gesture. My books aren't out yet. I don't need to like be able to impact people on this massive like spectrum, I'm really content impacting the people on my daily life in my community in a really positive way. And right now that's my impact, you know, but we all have that power. There's nothing special about what I'm doing. I just recognize it and I use it well. Hmm. It, I love it. There's, there's a couple of things there. Um, it, it feels like, um, 
there's this whole movement in say the corporate world around vulnerability and the importance of vulnerability. And, and that's like fantastic. And what it feels like is you're also now taking this um, back into the sort of schools and stuff as well, you know, saying it's, it's okay for teachers to, you know, to be that bit more human, to be that vulnerable so that the kids can relate to them. And I think there's so much power in, in just being authentic and being vulnerable and, uh, you know, having someone that's relatable, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, where was I going to go? There was something else there that I wanted to say, but I totally forgot what it was. (laughs) But, um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. There was another thing that I wanted to say. Um, But uh, uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm, very comforted to know that because I feel like that happens to me all the time. And so I'm, I'm just grateful whenever anybody else is like, forgets their train of thought. I'm like, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> but I know what it was now, actually. So, okay. so thanks for giving me that time. <laughs> um, yeah. you, it sounds like, um, and, and I can relate to this 100%, but I want to know like how it works for you. It sounds like you give out a lot of energy, right? And, um, therefore that, that is also like, you know, quite energy sapping, literally, um, how, how do you fill your own glass up or does by doing this, uh, actually fill your, your sort of your energy cup up? Oh yeah, for sure. My, my cup is always pretty much running at full maximum overflow capacity. Um, for a couple of reasons though, one is I definitely get back more than I give out. I just, I get so much back. Mm. But the second thing is that my perspective is the key to my happiness. And what you see, what you seek out is what you find. And so on any given day, I am just looking. I mean, I, it is a joke, but somebody will tell me a horrific story. And I have to be mindful because sometimes, don't get me wrong, it can be very annoying. My husband sometimes will come home and have had a really bad day. And I've learned that I don't quickly point out the positives because he just <laughs> wants to vent. And that is perfectly normal. But a lot of times, you know, like my mom or my sister will complain and I'll, I'll be quick to point out the positives. So I try to not do that too fast. But Whatever your, whatever your situation is, I swear you can find, you can extrapolate out something of good, even if it's just the lesson of like, wow, that was a horrible experience I just had. I'm really glad it's over. Like I was talking to somebody the other day and it was a tricky one. And I was like, ah, what is, what is, and I was like, well, the best part is that it's over. And she's like, I guess, but mm-hmm. I think it's just what you look for. And, and it's not even, it's like a well-trained muscle and my muscles, I, they, I always say they are my strongest muscles of seeking the positive and seeing the good. And so I think that it's just for anyone, that muscle is there. It might be more dormant. So you have to just be more mindful and practice it. But, you know, on any given day, it's like, oh my gosh, but the sun is so amazing today. And the amount of vitamin D I can get in 10 minutes is so exciting. Like just some beautiful, beautiful things. Mm -hmm. So that's, it doesn't take a lot. I guess that's another really big part piece to my puzzle. It doesn't take a lot to fill up my cup, even though it's a really big cup. Um, (laughs) But um, it doesn't, it doesn't because I'm just... You know, at the end of the day, right now, my kids are healthy and I'm healthy and I don't, I don't need too much more to be grateful for. So, but, but, but Casey, so look, that is great advice. You know, like exercising that muscle is, is, is a real thing. You can get better at improving your perspective in life, but do you have times where you just, like you're on your own, you know, there's no one there and you just like upset for a while and, and just actually see those emotions, feel those emo- emotions. Or do you tend to go, I shouldn't feel like this focus on positive And, uh, do you know what I mean? So, so how do you yeah. deal with those kind of emotions? Oh, um, I totally get what you're saying. And no, I am quite the feeler of all emotions and I, absolutely have those times. And then that is when I rely on my people, my safe people. And I'm very open and vulnerable with my daughters, with my husband. I never want anyone to think, and what I try to always share on my Instagram is, you know, I can't hide the fact that, and you guys now have been talking to me for an hour, and I'm sure you get a sense to who I am. 
it is who I am. It's really who I am. However, I'm human and I get disappointed and my jeans get tight and I don't get far enough in my business day. And I get all of that. I get overloaded and overwhelmed with laundry and family and obligations just like everybody else. And so when that happens, I definitely allow myself and I really process it. Um, I process it with anyone that's home and available or on the phone with me to, to say, this is really bothering me. But, but I've, I've recognized now that when I talk through it, when I just unload it, you know, that's most of the time what I need to do to like talk myself through the whole circle of back to, you know what, it's all okay. Like everything is just fine. Like it's a lot. I need to make a list. I need to get this checked off. I need to email this. Um, you know, there's definitely things that that's when I'm like, okay, I need to get disciplined and get some of this, whatever it is, figured out. But I usually just talk myself through it. And, you know, one of the things that I learned with my husband early on is, um, I think this is a great tip for any new couples, but especially after having a new baby, because one of the things we learned, and I think it's really common is, you know, I was staying at home. I was on my maternity leave, but I was at home from my teaching job. And my husband has a very high stress job and he would come home. And he would walk in the door and he was tired and stressed and he had been in traffic and all these different things. And so he had like all of his work stress. And I had like this really colicky baby that I thought needed an extra trimester in my womb because it was so colicky. <laughs> and it was a funny true story there. But um, I was just also depleted. And so what I noticed, what would happen is I was so excited to see him and he was so excited to see us. And then we would meet and within the first five minutes, which I truly believe sets the tone for all married couples, right? I believe the first five minutes of like the getting home part sets the tone for the whole night. And he would get home and he would carry his stress and I would have my stress. And it's like we were both jockeying for position to be validated for like mm. who had the harder day. And when you come to it like that, you're going to lose. And I remember so many times being like, I really wanted to have a great night. And you just blew that because now I'm so irritated with you. And what I learned was a little hack is that we would both come in and allow each other to say, unload on me. How was your day? Like, really, don't just tell me it was good. What were your highs? What were your lows? What are you carrying? What is your frustration and your stress at? What's on your immediate to-do list that could make you feel better? And we would both take the time to listen to each other and, and unload that. And then both of us would be able to validate, wow, that sounds heavy. That's a hard day. That was a hard interaction you had. That's a lot of emails you got to get out. But then there was no jockeying for a position. We both just needed to feel validated and walk ourselves all the way around to, yeah, but you know what? It actually was a pretty good day because now I'm here with you and it's all good. But so I guess my long answer to that is just processing it. I don't hold anything in. Um, thankfully, I've trained my husband really well and we talk it to an exorbitant mm -hmm. amount. But um, I just, whenever there's anything on my head or my heart, I need to get it out and work through it. And then I, I just kind of usually can just talk myself. To, I, I, I tell myself what I would tell anybody else. And that is like, I totally get it. I hear you. You've got a lot on your plate, but it's still going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, what I love about that as well is that you have uh, rituals and that's something we've discussed sort of lately as well. And and having a ritual is so powerful because mm -hmm. it becomes the habit and then it becomes your life just can become better just through these little rituals that you have throughout your day. And, and I think that's a really great ritual to, to add, you know, when you get home, you mm -hmm. already know this is what's going to happen. It's then, then there's no questions and then bang, you yeah. just feel better about it. So yeah, that's a great reminder. And just yeah. to add, add to that ritual there, like, and also just to give a different perspective, there's this great book called men are from Mars, uh, women are from Venus. And mm -hmm. <laughs> what they say in that book is like for example sometimes when 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 someone comes home from work generally a guy like if a guy comes home from from work uh what he actually wants when he gets home is he just wants 10 minutes by himself that's all he wants just let him get home 
have 10 minutes, go and go upstairs, take his work clothes off, maybe wash his face. And then he's, then he's good. Then he's like all yours. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but often what people get wrong, you know, uh, is that, um, say, say the lady will like, you know, ask him how his day was and all these sort of things. And then that just sort of heightens his kind of like, you know, level. And he's like, Oh, just leave me alone. So it's, yeah. it's about understanding, I think what works for, for different people. But, um, I yeah. definitely found for me personally, like when I, when I was working in the corporate world that I would need those 10 minutes at least, you know, like when I got home to go, cool, that's me. Let me go and pack my bags and I'm good. So <laughs> yeah. conversely as a, as a mom, I'm sure there's something that, you know, that you'd need and go like, cool. Well, when you get home, I need this from you, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and I think that's so key. You know, I've, I've learned a lot and I've gotten great at asking for it, right? Because it's so helpful to men and women when you can just say, you know what I need you to do is give mm. me a great big hug and just tell me it's all going to be okay. And then it mm. sets the tone. And instead of any resentment growing where it's like, I can't believe you sat on the couch and just turn on the totally. football, you know, like, mm then he's so grateful because he's like, oh, I can do that. I can mm, fulfill yeah. that need. Like, know thank what you, you need. for that. Yeah. And so it's just getting really clear on what you need, what you want. And, and my other um, big mantra is that it's all in the delivery. And I'm a hmm. big opponent with my kids, especially with my husband. But when I'm working with clients, I'm so reminding them that really it's all in the delivery. You can ask the same task but you can ask it kindly and and patiently and valuing that you know they have so much other stuff going on or you can kind of demand it and you're going to get completely different reactions right mm -hmm. and so it's just remembering about your delivery and how you ask for something is going to have an, a direct impact on how you receive it yeah, mm, yeah. Right. absolutely like you're totally speaking our language there. Like, I think communication is the most important thing in the world. Like, literally, it, it, it changes everything, you know what I mean? And then, like, it can set the tone for something, can change the direction of something. And we really need to be conscious that we all have a responsibility when it comes to communicating well, you know, and we, we all have, you know, a, a say in the way things can go and the directions they can go in by communicating well or by communicating badly. So mm -hmm. um, and just off the yeah. back of that, Gareth, I think it's just just to highlight how important it is to practice asking for what you want, and it doesn't mean you're being nasty mm. or being or being tough or you know right. wherever you are, you know, and you can start practicing it like at the store or on the airplane. You say like, mm. actually, that's not what I wanted. Like this is what I, you know, and just saying mm. that and and speaking mm. your truth to people, it doesn't mean you. For me, that's always been an issue. Like I always feel like bad, like to ask for something or, but actually that's just you being honest. And you, like you say, the way you ask is the key. So yeah. you know, it's great. Tips. Yeah, I can relate. That's our third born. That's our, that's our baby nature, right? That we were, mm -hmm. that we were raised to be the people pleasers and not say like, Oh, you actually got my order wrong. Like I yeah, wanted totally, this yeah. or that. And so, yeah. yeah, I've gotten so much better at being able to say like, you know, when, <laughs> when you have a minute, could we, could we change this? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yes. And uh, so, so you've also been referred to as the woman whisperer, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, why is that, first of all? And then, and how do you actually help women fall in love with themselves again? Well, I think I get that title for two, well, a, a couple different areas. But, you know, it's first falling, falling in love with their bodies as they are now is me really trying to teach them and get them to understand how it really is the only body they're ever going to get and how how they talk to themselves their their inner self that critic like you can't get in a that's where it has to start is with the inner little voice inside of you and so so many women want just like these huge, vast changes on the outside, but you're never going to get those, or at least I should say, you're never going to keep that, right? You're never going to be able to maintain that. You can, anybody can struggle and fight their body through a diet and lose 10 pounds. I really think they can. I mean, it might be hell and it might be really hard, but you can do that, right? But you won't stay there. 
And then that diet mentality, every time we fail a diet, which we've set ourselves up to fail by going on it in the first place, it like kind of like scrapes at our little self-esteem, our little heart inside of us of thinking that we're worthy and we're valued in our heart. And I mean, our body is beautiful. And so a lot of women come pretty depleted. And so it's starting from the inside, having them recognize what their value and their worth is outside of their physical body, right? Like what do they bring to the table in their relationships, in, at work, in their parenting styles? Like who are they other than just a body? and falling in love with that person. And so, you know, that mixed with then recognizing, for me, it, it's so huge. Like the aha moment is when you stop trying to lose 10 pounds, but you want to free yourself of disease and you want to put yourself in the best place to live a long, healthy life. Because, you know, I always say we all have cancer cells living in us, right? We all have that we have disease in us. And I really believe it's about triggers of turning them on or off or keeping things homeostasis and keeping things at bay. And so it's just wanting to come from the mind space of valuing your body as it's the only one you have. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the ways that I feel like women can really relate to that. I think the fact that I've struggled so much with my own body, that I was the youngest and had two older sisters and struggled with an eating disorder and then experienced such thinness and recognized that that did not serve me or bring me joy in any way. Um, you know, a lot of times to diets, striving for a diet, I like to say it's never really about the food. People think that they can't get a better looking body because they're, you know, obsessed with sugar or they like carbs too much. But really it's usually just a symptom of something else that needs to be worked on and processed through. And so when I talk to women, it doesn't usually take too long to realize that it's the food is the symptom of mm. something larger that's that's unsettling to them, whether it be their relationship or you know their career or something else that's going on in their life that's bothering them that sends them to the food. So mm. um, usually, when we can make peace with those other areas in their life, the food starts to self-regulate and work itself out, and then it all starts to come together. Mm. Um, yeah, I love the that other, about. Oh, sorry. Oh, go Kara. ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, please. Um, I was... I... <laughs> Carry on, Chris. <laughs> no, I, this is a separate thought on relationships. So, you, you, if you have a thought, please share it. No, no, go for it. I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, so, I was going to say, as far as relationships go, um, I think women and men, like I'm so with you both on it's communication, 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 and the more we do it the better we get at it and the better listeners we get, we become the better we are at asking what we want in a, in a kind way. Even like I, you even get better at being angry and you know, I never want my kids. I think it's really helpful for them to see us have healthy arguments and me say, dad is driving me crazy because of how he's handling this situation. It's not how I would handle it, but it's okay, but it's driving mommy crazy. Like, I don't want to give them this fairy tale idea of like, oh my goodness, I'm having a fight with my partner later in life. Mm -hmm. My parents never showed that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a trust there. Like I, I trust my relationship with my husband. I even trust my relationship with my friends and my sisters that you can get upset and it's okay. And it took me a long time. I think there's a lot of power to recognizing that any relationship worth having is going to take a lot of work. And sometimes that's our partner or our spouse, but sometimes that's our, our, our work partner or our coworkers or our parents or, you know, my sister and I, it took us a long time because I felt like, oh, but I love her so much and I never want to get mad at her. But there was such a freedom when I was like, oh, wait, you know, what's the best part about a relationship. I can, I can disagree with you. I can say you hurt my feelings and need to take a little moment, but I trust and know that we will come back better than we even were before. And that's so powerful. And so I think a lot of people are, um, 
we're not raised sometimes to like to be taught how to communicate well you know we're taught to like just be quiet and listen or just avoid conflict at all times which is kind of what i did and so it's so freeing because you just get your voice back but in a very honest truthful way and the truth is always always going to be helpful right so um but i think that the people i work with and the whole woman whisperer is because a lot of people just need some guidance on on that mm -hmm. you've given us so much uh, perspective mm -hmm. on on so many wonderful things casey seriously it's uh, it's really great advice and i think people with relationships as you mentioned we tend to keep them all separate. Okay, this is my husband or my wife. This is my child. And, but actually, almost like what you were saying with the diet, there's a deeper cause or deeper um, meaning. And I think with relationships, any relationship, there's a deeper layer. It's like they all have a certain substrate that you have to work from and you should practice with all of them and, and honesty and authenticity and all these kind of things play into any relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And which makes all the other relationships that much better too, because you've practiced it with your work colleague and with your kid and, you know, so mm -hmm. that's really, really great advice. Thank you. Yeah. It's so interesting. Cause I do say all the time. Um, I always, I, I always tell people, I'm very honest with the fact that my relationship with my husband is I work harder. There's nothing that I work harder at than my relationship with my husband. And when I say that, I don't mean that in a way that it never feels like work. I just mean we never let our relationship not be the priority for two reasons. One is I truly, well, this I know to be a fact. One is when my husband and I are not in a good place, nothing else is in a good place. So when you just touched on that, as far as like, you know, if my husband and I are disputing about something and we're not in a good place, it's going to be coming out on my kids. It's going to be coming out in my family, in the community stuff I'm trying to do. I'm not going to bring my best to any of those people mm -hmm. because I'm in a distracted spot, right? And so, so that's one reason why my relationship with him is the core. But the second is, is that I think more than our kids need anything, more than they need food on the table or, you know, they need a healthy mom and dad that model a healthy, happy relationship. And it's not always rainbows and unicorns, but our kids now have that trust that we can disagree or drive each other crazy here or there, but they mm -hmm. trust, they have that safety. And it must be because, and my parents had a good relationship, but I think I still always had that fear of like, my goodness, are they going to get divorced? Like, are they going to be like my friends? And, you know, there's no guarantees on anyone, but I feel like kids should feel safe in the fact that like, oh yeah, they're, you know, bothering each other, but we communicate even when we're arguing, it's fairly. And so I just think that's really important. But like what you were just touching on, they're all interconnected. They're all related to each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my last thing to say about that is, when we got married 16 years ago, you know, our vows were that we wouldn't go off for our days and treat other people better than we would come home and treat ourselves. And, you know, when you first get newly married, you think, oh, that will, of course not, right? You're so excited and you're so over the top in love and it's a beautiful thing. But, you know, five years later, new kids later, sleep deprived later, stress of jobs later, building a house together later, like all of those things, they wear you down, right? And unfortunately, what I think we often, often do is we often take our stresses out on the people that we can take them out on, right? So you, if you're having a bad day, you're not going to go and take it out on your boss. You're not going to go and take it out on, you know, your neighbors or your coworkers. You're going to give your best to them. And like I always joke and say that like, you know, you would never be rude to your barista, like the person who gives you your coffee, you're delightful to. You open the door for everybody coming on that, you know, the train and all the different things and you smile at the people on public transportation. So why would you come home? Mm. And and why would you come home to your loved ones? and give them your cranky, angry leftovers, because those are the people that you love more than anything. So mm. they should get the best of you. And I like, we've done a really good job of visualizing that. Like, I'm not saying don't be nice to your baristas, but mm. like 
if you're giving, you shouldn't be treating your coworkers and your boss and your hairdressers with more love and kindness and support than you would your spouse or your partner or your son. And I think that we can get caught up in taking out our stress and our grief on our loved ones because for some reason we can't because they'll still okay. love us. Mm. But that's not going to set up your relationships to be very strong. <laughs> yeah. Great advice. Eh? <laughs> yeah, so many good reminders, seriously. Like, yeah, it's, uh, that's, I, I just love that one as well. Um, just good reminder for myself, you know, as well, just to, to think of that every single day in, in my relationship as well. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, look, it's been an amazing time here speaking with you. Um, and we are coming to an end. So just before Craig asked you the last question, what have you kind of uh, got going on in the future or what are you most excited about? And also how can uh, people get in touch with you? Um, so I've got so many exciting things. I've got a little cooking um, show coming up at the end of this month. So if you're local, that'll be exciting. Um, kind of a self-love cooking seminar. And that's exciting. Um, I did win an amazing opportunity. I wish I could give you more about it. So we'll have to chat later. Um, and I can tell you how it goes. In the end of October, I have, I'm one of three people that won an opportunity for a, a weekend mastermind with 14 of the top female entrepreneurs in the mm -hmm. fields of health and wellness, um, marketing and business. So yeah, let's, I, I, I just plan on being a sponge and soaking up everything I can mm -hmm. and coming back and paying it forward. Um, so that'll be fun. Maybe we can chat after that. And, mm -hmm. and definitely my website, um, www.coupleofcasey.com. It's a work in progress, but it is in progress and it is only going to improve with more time. And my YouTube channel, Cup of Casey, is where I plan on, as soon as I get a little hack fix that is causing me some glitches, um, mm -hmm. I have a ton of videos on food and body positivity, raising kids, and a lot of relationship work um, that will be posted um, in the very near future. So I hope that you will come and find me and subscribe over there at Cup of Casey. But always drop me a line. I, I love to connect. And on Instagram, of course, I'm um, under Cup of Casey. And I just love to, to fill, fill, fill people's hearts and to connect with people on a more personal level. So I really do hope to connect with some of your great listeners. Mm, thank you very thank much. You. Sure, we will. And we really encourage people. You've got a great message. And so thanks for sharing that. And so, just our last question, Casey. So, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Hmm. Uh, um, you know, and I've listened to so many, and you've had so many amazing people on that had incredible answers. <laughs> and uh, and I thought, you know, I, I wanted to kind of prepare, but then not prepare. And um, I feel very not prepared. So uh, <laughs> the good news is you're catching me off the cuff. And that is, I think being ridiculously human is just really knowing your story and believing in your story. Like, you know, there's no good, bad, better story. And, you know, pain is pain. And at the end of the day, I think we're all more alike than we are different. And I mm. love that about this podcast. So for me, it's, it's really owning and loving my story and appreciating all of the hard times for all of the, all of the positive, amazing things it's taught me. Um, but it's just being truly, I love the word human, right? Because when you, when you say the word human, it just, you evoke such emotion. So mm. for me, being ridiculously human is just being really real and authentic and loving my hot mess of a beautiful story mm -hmm. and, and loving it, all the parts and pieces of it, and just really trying to use it to pay it forward with other people. Oh, thank you. And yeah. that's uh, exactly what you did here today. So just from my side, you know, just thank you so much for your calm, honest um, delivery of, of your story. It's just um, super inspiring. And, uh, you know, you, you're creating the ripples in your life at home first, which I love with, within yourself first, you know, and, and those ripples are now extending out into the, the community and to the people around you. And uh, it, it really is infectious. And, um, uh, you know, you've got so many 
tips and tricks to like, there's actually so much in there, like which mm-hmm. what you spoke about today that we can definitely, I look forward to along with Gareth, you know, we're going to, we're going to delve into this more in our superhumanship episode. And there's so much actually to, to discuss there because your story is very familiar to a lot of people, even though you've been through a lot of different, maybe things that are more tough than a lot of people. There's a lot in there that is so familiar and that we can literally take home and to, you know, today. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it, thank you for that. And um, just thanks for, for being such a, um, a kind person in the world because that's what the world needs more of. And, and you, you are being that person. So thanks for thank coming you. on our show and giving us, uh, you know, just a piece of your, of your time because it's really been valuable. Oh, thank you guys so much. It's been a lot of fun. So thanks for taking a chance on me and having me on. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> That's cool. And then just, just briefly for me, Casey, I just wanted to uh, echo what Craig said and just say, uh, it's been, it's been seriously just so awesome chatting to you. And, and I, I'm so happy that you got in touch with us on, on Instagram and, uh, it's, it's the way, like Craig says, the way you tell your story and also it's this calmness, but it's also, uh, you have this beautiful enchanting voice. And <laughs> when you were, when you were saying like, um, you know, how you say, I love you to everyone, I can only imagine it like it almost, your voice almost sounds like, it's this loving voice, you know, yeah. so it's almost like it's meant to be that you, you tell people that you love them. Um, and so you, I really let those pizza believe me then that I love them. Oh, love they it. totally, they, they're like, wow, this lady loves me. Good. That's great. Um, but, but no, it's your energy too. And you have a very special energy about you and uh, that's really infectious. And um, I think the, the work that you're doing especially with youngsters and especially with teenagers and especially with this phase that we're going through now, like of social media and phones and technology um, is so needed, you know, and coming from a lady like you who just sort of exudes this confidence and love and like acceptance, you know what I mean? That, that's what, that's what those, those kids are looking for, you know, cause they're still trying to find their feet and having someone uh, there like yourself to lead them, I think is, is very empowering. Um, so yeah, it's just been, it's just been fascinating, uh, amazing. Um, and all these things, um, speaking with you, um, and like you said at the start, you know, uh, people are going to, um, love your story and love you. And, and we totally do as well. So, um, thank you again. And, uh, really look for looking forward to, you know, seeing how this goes and, and, and where everything goes for you and this, this amazing mastermind that you're going on. I mean, that sounds epic. So well done for that. And, uh, yeah, just wishing you. you an amazing day. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. And you guys, I can't thank you enough. You put out so much great content and it's all so inspiring. If I could just send all my little teens over to listen to you guys, you'd be great role models. So honestly, we we need more of what you're doing in the world is a better place because you guys are doing what you're doing. So thank you both. Amazing. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging 